Hmm, computers, great. Um, yeah, hi. Um, so my talk, Humane uh, Database Design and Programming, uh, is actually not quite just about HANA, um, so it's, it's not exactly uh, what it turned out to be. I promise it would be about uh, doing Right, uh, d doing database programming and making it fast and flexible and ideally right as well with examples from SAP development and from customer. Turned out it didn't. Uh, it's mostly thoughts about, uh, from my thoughts about writing and asking questions and getting answers. Well, so maybe that's interesting too. Uh, it was for me to write this. Um, yeah, that's, that's me, Lars Bredeman, and we've got the Flickr again. That's awesome. Um, I used to work for SAP uh, about 15 years, and then last year I uh, moved into the independent contracting. Um, got a company now, uh, Data Process Insights, where I mostly do uh, consulting on solution architecture, obviously in the data processing space. So data processing, analytics, um, getting your organization to get something out of the data uh, is, is what I'm interested in. Quite obviously, if it's to do with HANA, that's great because I know how that works um, roughly. Uh, I also know how Oracle works. So, yeah, you get the idea. I also write a blog at uh, lbrederman.org uh, where I um, give, give uh, little uh, tidbits uh, or just document my experiences with the world of uh, data processing. Uh, and there's uh, the link to the company website. Um, yeah, maybe as a starter after the pizza to, to wake up again. I think that's probably something everyone can relate to. Uh, you write something really nice and then you th you're proud of yourself. You go into the weekend and uh, you come back and just want to kill your past self because whatever you wrote, it does not make much sense. Um, so this talk sort of addresses that a little bit. Um, Next thing uh, is a bit uh, starting up for people who write code. Um, I gathered from from the um, from the queries before that some of you actually do that uh, occasionally. Uh, maybe some someone here also writes SQL every now and then. So j just a quick show of hands. Look at the code and raise your hand if you are feeling comfortable of telling me what this thing does. Yep. Okay, one. There's actually an example I picked out of the um, HANA community forum um, because it came up there. So there's something happening. Uh, it, it describes what it should be doing, but it's not in the, in the comment section. But it's not quite clear how it does it and what rules apply if you look at it. And uh, believe me, even if you stare at it longer, it doesn't become immediately clear. Um, so what I did was, and I also wrote a blog about that, uh, what was to sort of refactor that to, to figure out what, what it's doing, and maybe we can write that in a bit, uh, more concise way that helps us to, to understand what's going on. So the first thing I did was uh, getting rid of all those comments that looked like uh, COBOL commenting. Uh, there's this uh, versioning systems now there where you can put in your commit message, and, and that should take care of that. So we can uh, save a bit. Um, and if we reformat the code, it gets a bit more uh, obvious uh, how the control flow is, but not quite what it does. Um, so the first thing to notice is uh, we got um, date um, parameters coming in. And they're, just to be sure that they are dates, they are reformatted and reconverted into dates again, uh, just to be very sure about that. Uh, that doesn't really do anything for our application, so um, we can get rid of that. Um, and we see a bit better that there's actually this very simple if-then-else construct, and there's some bit more complicated condition that basically says, okay, if that condition is met in some way, then return T for true, or in all other cases, it's going to be false. So let's look at that condition. Um, so the first thing here, where the first line uh, before the or is basically saying, okay, that seems to be any date between today and 30 days in the past. Fairly obvious. The other part of the, the, um, the or clause there is not that quite obvious. So what does this extract month from add days uh, 
not equal extract month from date really mean? Any idea? That would be... Mm. Yep, it checks whether or not that date, this uh, check date is the last day of its month, right? So uh, for, for January it will be 31st, for February, depending on which month it is, uh, would be 28th or 29th and so forth. All right, um, we can use a function for that. It's called last date. <laughs> Much more handy and uh, gives us the same result. Um, so. This could be already the point where you think, oh, that, that's a bit of an odd rule, right? Either it's 30 days in the past, or it's the last day of any month whenever that day was posted. So that might be not the right rule you want to implement, but it's probably beside the point here. On a more technical level, um, the, the way this is written is not really concise, though, right? So we got an assignment up here for a return variable that is a string. Uh, and we, we get another assignment that is sort of the uh, assignment that happens only when it's true further down. So, uh, we want to clean, clean that up a bit. Also, like the names of the, uh, the variables are probably also not too telling, right? So, for example, t two day uh, today, we can figure, okay, that's probably always the current date. It's, it's never going to be anything else than the current date, very unlikely. At least that seems to be the purpose. So we can change all that. Um, I change it to uh, w with a more uh, telling name. Data is in uh, uh, edit period. Uh, we only have one input parameter now, which is the day to be checked, uh, because we replaced all the other parameters for today with the function current date, which gives us the same thing and makes the function itself a bit easier. Also change the return, uh, uh, return type to integer. Any idea why that might be a smart move to do? Instead of saying, okay, uh, I can't return a Boolean because SQL doesn't, uh, SQL script doesn't give me that. So why is that maybe better than having the characters? Well, the thing is, you can't really calculate, do, do any calculation with the characters. But what you can do is with the, uh, with the integers, um, you can do something like this, right? You can do a calculation and only sum up those numbers that are in the, the edit period. The rest is automatically ignored because it's uh, set to zero. Well, that's a consideration you, you might want to look at then. Um, and then obviously, um, these two assignments, uh, if you've ever done structured coding and stuff, that's not nice coding. You assign the result twice in your function, that's rubbish. Let's do a case, and you have one assignment statement there. And, well, now you actually see what's happening, um, and you also still wonder why this weird rule of the last day of the each posting month there is. But that's probably beyond the scope of that refactoring. The rest, that is just to show the same functionality given, um, but changing how you write this thing, you get a much better outcome for yourself and everybody else who's going to read that. Because now, in fact, you don't even need to read that code to understand what the function does. It, it tells you with its name, I'm telling you this data was in edit period or not. Okay, that's just a uh, warm-up teaser. So, um, how do we get here? Uh, how do I get here? Um, just, uh, I believe, uh, briefly after high school, I came about that book. Um, it's it's uh, that's a German translation. Um, it's that's the English title: "The Writer's Journey: uh, Mythic Structure for Writers." Um, the idea here is that, um, and uh, th that goes back to Joseph Campbell, uh, who himself worked on a lot of uh, Hollywood movie scripts. And the idea here is that uh, a lot of the successful stories, that, stories that resonate and work uh, with people, they have a very very common structure, right? So uh, Joseph Campbell, he has this idea of the, the, the hero's journey that goes from the unknown into the unknown world where he faces, uh, where he faces uh, challenges. Uh, he gets some sidekicks, some, some, some magic help. Uh, and just when it seems to be all going too swell, there's another thing that seems totally unsurmountable. And yet eventually he overcomes that challenge and he sort of ends up in the same space he was before. 
and Luke Skywalker's back at his, uh, at, at his place, right? So he, he worked with, uh, with, with, um, Lucas films on these scripts, right? And if you, uh, really interesting book, uh, and if you look at it, uh, you definitely go to the movies in a different way. One, um, referring that is, um, this idea of that you have, um, structure that, that, that pervades meaning per se. It's very close to, uh, what you, when you think about architecture, how the structure of buildings changes the way that the buildings work and how people feel in them. Uh, that's a very similar thing with, with stories and, and uh, storytelling. Uh, and of course, most people do have this idea of, okay, if you have a play going on, we have three acts and, and what sort of happening in these acts. So I figured I might as well uh, put, place this structure of three acts of uh, setup, confrontation and resolution to this talk, so let's see how we go. Um, act one is the setup. Um, let's say, well, I don't know about you, but I come to, to SQL programming uh, a bit like forcefully pushed by my boss back then. Um, I was initially hired to do uh, network administration, exchange server setup, that sort of stuff. And he said, oh, well, you know, our project uh, our plan just changed. Um, you're going to write this. Uh, well, <laughs> that's great. So uh, you, you do start and then look at this. Um, and even if you have some, some programming background, then, then you figure, okay, it's just another language to learn. So um, I figured it would make sense to sort of compare this to, to, to learning a secondary language. For, for me, the first secondary language was English, um, probably to some others here as well. Um, and that's, um, that's uh, for, for me, that was a similar experience, right? So you do start off very, very simple, right? So you, you get hammered by grammar and syntax, and you have to do your vocabulary and do that, and you write tests every week, and so that you build up a um, catalog of words you know. And here, yeah, well, what you can do with the language is not particularly much. You can say, hey, I'm Lars, how are you? And that's about it, right? You're not very expressive, um, and that doesn't really give you that much. Uh, but it, it, you have to have to know it to actually get further. So um, that's the same with SQL. Uh, you, you do see the tutorials that tell you, yeah, well, SQL, too easy. Select star from table, where XY. Um, that's it. Um, yeah, it, it's not really. You don't get that far, and you don't get much out of the language. Um, so you can go online. There's heaps of great tutorial sites, uh, and I, each of those is a really good introduction. And there's no way around having those introductions, right? At some level, you, at some point, you have to do those. Uh, you might even go and say, "Well, I'm more into reading. This one I can recommend: the Manga Guide to Databases." Um, really great read, and it gets the point across. It doesn't make you a great writer or anything like that, but it, you get the same sort of information. Um, so you sort of graduate, you move on, you have seen a, f a few examples, you've done all the tutorials, that's perfect. So next thing is you write, uh, you have short readings, right? You're able to understand shorter pieces of code that maybe you have. Uh, I don't know, a grouping function, some sorting function. And um, since you're actually uh, on the clock here and you need to deliver some stuff, you start to getting practical. That means you start Googling, you start finding out, okay, I've got this problem, how do I do that uh, in SQL? So you, you get to know a few figures of speech, or something like uh, where Bob's your uncle, or how to do a running sum. Um, and so you sort of get into this getting stuff done mode. And uh, when it becomes tricky, perfect, you know how to Google and how to, you know, uh, to, to look stuff up. So you go to the books. And there are plenty of awesome books out there. In my experience, I'd say most of the problems you'll face in your uh, in your day-to-day -day life with uh, handling SQL data, is covered in one of those books, right? Whether it's how do I need to structure my application? Like Tom Kai from Oracle, fantastic author, sadly already retired, but he made very good points about, okay, I've got a data application, how do I need to build that to make it work properly? Uh, Joe Salker, he worked on SQL standard for many years, 
the books cover everything from, okay, I need to do a running sum even though my platform doesn't cover it, or I need to do implement a media function, or, uh, okay, I've got hierarchies, how do I query that efficiently, and what doesn't work? So, uh, and then this guy here, Marcus Wienand, Austin guy uh, from uh, Vienna has this uh, website, Modern SQL, uh, covering modern development of SQL and how these fu how the new functionality works, what it gives you, which um, which databases cover those, to what extent. Really well worth uh, looking into. Uh, this book was recently on for download on free uh, for free. Can definitely recommend that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there that you can use and deploy and. With that, you can absolutely get along, right? So you can make a good living, and of course, you can also go to the uh, to the user forums. Um, there's there's nothing wrong with that, and it def it definitely, in most cases, should get you across the line in terms of I need to deliver something for my project. I need to write a statement. Um, the problem, and then. <sighs> In most cases, that's sort of where you get stuck a bit, right? So this getting stuff done is practically what your boss is interested in, right? So it's, it's not really keen. Uh, your employer is probably not very keen on getting you to be the best writer of SQL there is on the planet. If you get that select statement done, that's all good. Um, and then um, there's this um, things that constrain you because, well, you just have to adhere to the development guidelines and the naming conventions. And then, uh, like, this one is the block uh, I found. There's a huge list of things, how to do uh, SQL development and naming conventions are in there. Uh, the thing is, some of the stuff is a bit of a cargo cult, right? So if you think about it, yeah, maybe for a huge organization having a consistent naming convention has some inherent benefit, but usually if you look at a name and uh, the first 10 letters are acronyms for what kind of view that is, that doesn't tell you all that much. That doesn't give you any insight in what this thing is doing. So you still have to look into it and try and decipher that. Um, and you're also very often then maybe constrained to, okay, I can't use that. I have to use... I don't know, analytic views, even though they are outdated, but the development guidelines tell me to. So you sort of get stuck in this, this copy and modify approach where you, well, you have a grasp of the, the language and, uh, you, you've got a growing catalog of, of solutions to problems that you can employ. You're not really free to, to design your own, uh, sentences there, right? And, then at the end, the query then is okay when there's no error code, which, yeah, it's not wrong, but it's not that right either, right? Because um, the next step, so to speak, would be, well, you get away from, I just adhere to the pure syntax rules to, okay, I can have bigger context that I actually express and then bigger concept that I want to cover. Um, so uh, with English, that would be, okay, you start reading your novels, right? Nothing super heavy, maybe, maybe not, uh, uh, not not something uh, too crazy, but you can do stuff like Jill Verne or, or Mark Twain. Uh, and then with SQL, well, maybe you heard about something like Explain Plan. Well, if it's slow, you can look into that. That's great. And you, you might heard of, okay, you can, there's more than just a group by. You can do group by groupings and that sort of stuff. Um, so at least you've got an awareness of the, well, the, there is ac actually more than select staff from, which is very good. Um, the thing is, it really doesn't get you that much further. You're, you're still in this uh, mediocre level, so to speak, of saying, okay, I get my stuff done, I'm, I'm all right, I don't need to write a huge novel here. Um, and that is perfectly valid as well, right? You, you can do that. and. Um, um, Again, on that level, if you say, well, I've written my statement, worked fine, now it doesn't, how do I make it fast? Again, there's plenty of literature out there that you can go to uh, that explain how to look at performance, that explain how to look at uh, the logic behind statements and, and uh, relational algebra. Uh, Lex de Haan, Torn Coppola's, and C.J. Dave. Fantastic books. Uh, not very much on the practical, this is how you do template style is really about uh, mathematical concepts. 
Uh, but again, you get a lot of information out of that, and it can operate on that level. Sadly, you can, <laughs> because um, it, this, this level does get you far, but only so far. It really doesn't give you uh, the, the, the options that the language would provide you with. Um, so, um, and this technical tuning, again, um, can also only get you so far. Right, yes, you, 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 can, uh, you can add another index on a table, and that makes something faster. If the, if the query is rubbish, that might not help after all, right? And uh, if you think about it, okay, how, how much do you improve a novel, let's say uh, Mark Twain, when you just run a spell checker on over it? The, the point is not that the grammar is right there, right? So, and you basically throw it over the fence, uh, let the DBA sort it out, um, and then they do some whatever they do, uh, but you can't be bothered with that. It's DBA country. Um, and then there are those other concerns that come into, into your mind saying, okay, this whole, this whole relational database stuff, that is, um, that is rubbish anyway. Because every time I change my data uh, in, in my application, I need to go back, change that bloody table. And then that's a back and forth taking me time. Um, so how about these NoSQL schema-less databases that are available now? They are fantastic. Um, and with schema less, uh, basically what that means, it's, uh, it's schema on read, right? So these databases, they allow you to just drop whatever you want into them. And when you get it back, that's when you make sense out of what you get, right? So that's the general idea. And yeah, um, question is, does that solve any of your problems immediately? Uh, it definitely solves the problem of I need to change my database when I change my application, because now you don't. Now you just write out whatever you want. Um, but the question is really, where do you keep the information, what that data means in your application? So uh, if, you, if you're like uh, somebody like, like Uncle Bob Martin there, right, he's a big proponent of saying, well, pff, database, implementation detail. We can store wherever. We don't care. The information about what the uh, what the app is about, that's in the app, which, fair enough, is, is a good point. And you can treat the database as a bit bucket um, and just get your data back out there. You can definitely do that. Um, I might differ, and uh, uh, I might uh, have a different opinion. Also, um, most likely, since you're working with SAP solutions, you all have a different experience <laughs> because SAP is heavily built around uh, a database, uh, one shared database, right? So you get rather this approach uh, in, the, in the lower part, where you have an application, and you've got a database, and it has similar information in a different form in the database. Uh, and that database is then shared by several apps later on. So um, you, you have this schema on read again, uh, and then you've got these schema on write apps that are associated with these uh, classic SAP monolith. Uh, we first define our table, then we write our data, then we might read the data again. Um, so these are sort of the, the two uh, big opposing sides to it. Um, but the reality that most of us are, are dare to say faces, it's never just one app and the database. It's always like this. There's an app that gets its database, or at least a part of the database schema, and then there's another app that also comes with a database, how handy. They all need to integrate, partly on database level, partly on application level. Uh, and so where is it knowledge about the data now? Yeah, it's everywhere, exactly. And it's everywhere different. So that's fantastic. Um, pretty sure I stole that one from Richiki. Couldn't find that presentation again, but uh, highly recommend it to you to look up uh, Richiki, uh, inventor of closure. Uh, awesome talks. Anyway, so we've got this problem, right? And um, the solution, the, the enterprise solution to this is what? It's integration software, of course, uh, which we're not talking about today. <laughs> so, um, we're not going to do that. Um, so the, 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 for, for our third, uh, third act now to, to sort of face this problem, uh, we, we need a resolution, obviously. And the re resolutions, excuse me, is to realize, um, well, yes, SQL databases are 
schema on write. It needs to be ready when you write to it, but it's meaning on read, right? So SQL databases have this nice um, property that the data is there, it's stored in tables, but nobody forces you to read exactly, the, uh, read it out exactly the way it was entered, right? It's it's no problem to say, well, there's uh, invoices and line items in there, and uh, I'm not interested in all of these details. I just want to see the summed up numbers uh, and the, the the business volume of the last month. You can do that easily. Your meaning, your, the way you query the data changes the meaning uh, that you get out of it. So it's it's. Schema on write and meaning on, uh, on read. Then asking the database different questions actually produces new insights and knowledge. That's something that's easily overlooked, especially when you follow that approach of, oh, I just a bit bucket, I store my data, get it out again, and get some transactional guarantees about that, and that's it. Um, that, that's not the big benefit. You can have transactional um, consistency. Well, not easily. It's not easy, but you can get that without the overhead of having a 4 GL language. So uh, something that's, in my experience, very, very often uh, overlooked and, and undervalued, it's, it's never just the data in the database. It's the data and the query that makes the meaning and gets you value out of it. And then at that point, you can say, OK, I'm actually reading proper literature and actually getting some new ideas out of stuff, right? I can read Hemingway, Steinbeck, or Foucault, if you're so inclined, uh, or say, okay, well, what does data mean? Uh, not, not on a uh, data model, okay, it's here in the ERD diagram uh, level, but what does that data mean to my business? Because at the end, that, that's the sort of question you, you like to be able to answer. Um, as a piece approach to that thinking, as, as far as I'm Concerned is that they um, came with with uh, their, their introduction in, uh, of, of HANA uh, when they introduced these virtual data models, right? And the idea here is that they have predefined views on the tables, so the applications still go and write into the tables. They're just some random slides again stolen from the community uh, blogs. Um, but the key point here is that. When you define those views, you, you do get to make that mapping of, okay, well, I've got my table fields here, and they, they have some sort of meaning in terms of my application. But there's also uh, a business-related concept that I want to express with this. Right? So you can uh, go and make, uh, have that meaning imposed on that qu sort of safe query that you have there. That's one of the big ideas that SAP gives and uh, say, okay, well, um, you know, you can uh, plug together the tables again and over and over again. We want to speed that up. We tell you this is how the tables go together and this is how we see these concepts represented from our standard applications. Obviously, if your configuration or your usage of the system differs, you might want to change that. You might want to add or adjust those mappings to actually produce a sense uh, you're interested in. So, um, which sort of leads us to, to the next point, and that is, uh, okay, so does that get us actually to this idea of, of self-service uh, analytics, uh, where, where business users go and analyze the data and then find out new things, how to make more money or lose less of it? Um, well, usually, no, right? So usually, you still do have to talk with, with uh, subject matter experts that, that talk to you in business lingo, and uh, in your head you're going, oh, well, there's this field, and uh, there's this table, and uh, I can't do that. So uh, this is uh, not really what uh, was promised, right? Uh, what was promised uh, many, many decades ago, ago was actually uh, something like this, right? You're getting your answers at electronic speed, an operation in real time. I like that one. Um, so, which, which Hannah also promises. Um, so, from an implementation point of view, who thinks this dashboard answers one question or a single question? Right. There are many questions answered here. It's a, it's a complex piece of information display, uh, yet I've seen many projects where you have the one model that feeds into the dashboard the one and only model, and yet you have very different concerns represented here. 
So maybe that gives a hint of that one model approach isn't really the way to go for in, in terms of how you want to develop that. And uh, yeah, well, I've seen a couple of projects that, that really struggled with that, realizing, okay, if we go with that approach, we're never going to get any performance out of it. So th there is a necessity to, to have a, um, a kind of common understanding of uh, the concepts that are actually being represented in your data analytics. But if you go and say, well, I don't care what the business thinks uh, are fiscal years, I just go what's configured in my table, that's grand and that definitely can get you through the project. It doesn't quite get you to, to an understanding though, right? So you need to have this common idea about what your domain space is there and what is possible to do on that domain space, right? So if you say, well, I, I don't know, I've, I've, uh, just an example I heard about yesterday, um, customer report or should should be changed. There is a year-to-date figure and, and uh, it's uh, the report uh, just selects a specific day and then it shows a year-to-date figure. Customer wants, no, no, not a single day, we want a range of dates. So what happens with the year-to-day value when you have a range of three months? Right? That's conceptually, you need to understand what you're asking, what's possible in terms of uh, operations on these concepts to do, right? Because at the end of the day, you do want to leave you the users of whatever is being produced with some sort of uh, empowerment that they can do something with the information. It doesn't help uh, if, if you look at the data and think, mm, I'm not sure what that means. So, um, uh, one book I, I really like this is um, Badass Making Users Awesome by Kathy uh, uh And she talks about um, how relevant it is to, to take away mental burden when operating and when creating products and solutions, right? How focusing uh, what you're doing and what you're dealing with actually makes it possible to then go and say, well, uh, now I've got 10 cycles more in my head available to think about things. Now I can actually think about what I'm seeing. Now I don't need to worry about what it means. I can go and say, well, okay, with that sales figure, I need to do something else. Um, so both empowering your users and, and yourself, obviously, uh, your future you will probably be happy to, to find something it understands, and also remove blocks and mental load. Right? Every time I need to do that mapping again in my head, that's time wasted um, that, that I can't spend on anything else. So, uh, I mean, the, the big idea, of course, is domain-driven design. Uh, fantastic book, again. And the, the, the glossary is as great as well, right? So uh, an entity, which uh, is very core to the idea of database development, an entity there is defined as not by its attributes, but by the idea that it has an identity and some continuity to it, right? So it, it's it's really the idea that there's something individual that I'm thinking about, it's not the tables or the, 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 the columns. That's something, well, you know, the, the map is not the terrain. You, you have to distinguish here between the idea and how that idea is expressed. Um, and I, that's the, the sort of then the next step. If you think about, okay, well, if I'm trying to solve problems with ideas, then uh, having abstraction um, is really a helpful tool because I can get rid of it. Like this uh, virtual data model, it is an abstraction. But the idea of abstraction is not to, to sort of make it less clear. It's in, in fact, it's sort of reducing, uh, your focus, your mental focus on what's essential, right? So this, uh, famous Dijkstra quote, uh, is, is to say, the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level, a new level of meaning, where you can absolutely precise about be absolutely precise about what you actually mean, um, and yeah, I mean, thanks to <laughs> you can argue about that, but um, he's not the only one uh, thinking that way, right? Um, mentioned Rich Hickey before, um, and he says, okay, when you think about what, what's making your life simple and straightforward, uh, it is not so much that. Uh, Simple is, is just one thing and it, it doesn't spread out and it's, it's not uh, sort of, um, it's, it's not a, um, what do you call it, a manifold of things or just one inst instance or an operation. It is that it is about one concern, 
right? You, you, de you design something to be about one thing and just about that one thing. That might be a complicated thing or um, something that has many aspects to it, uh, so it doesn't need to be simplistic, but the thing is it doesn't interleave with other concerns, right? So um, also, uh, Simple Made Easy, a uh, very good talk, recommend it. Uh, another one who also goes in the same direction, Alan Kay, of course, to say um, the you can make a problem easier to solve if you change, if you actually take that step and make that abstraction and ta take a different perspective. Right? He, he uh, this is uh, attributed with this quote: uh, um, "Point of view is worth 80 IQ points." That is not because where well, you change your your perspective, and all of a sudden you're smarter, but it allows you to do things on a completely different meaningful level, right? We have this uh, one of his many talks where he talks about, okay, well, you can anyone can make a doghouse. You don't need to be an architect to do that. It will it will work, right? If, you, if you're not hurting yourself in the process, it will sort of be a doghouse, and that works out. But if you try and do something like the Superdome, that doesn't work out if you have if you don't have a proper idea how you construct things, how how these things work together, right? So, as with our language learning, uh, on a very uh, low level, yeah, you do get along with a lot of basic uh, intuitive things where you don't have where you don't have to really think about it. You just do, and then it works out, and don't worry about it. But if you want to step up uh, and make it larger or faster or more distributed, if you want to scale, uh, to, to use that word, um, then you do need to have a better point of view and a better idea about what what this thing you're building there is about. right? And um, this, this quote, you get simplicity by finding a slightly more sophisticated building block to build your theories of. Right? So you don't need to go and make this super complex thing, but it really helps if you sort of get that one step up and see uh, where this leads you. Right, so um, it sort of sums it up. Uh, it's important to, to have that shared idea of the domain space, and it's important that your database model actually corresponds to that idea and represents what, what you have sort of in your mind when you talk about that. Uh, and it also allows uh, to consider broader concerns. Right? You can think about, OK, well, if you feed your AI algorithm with, with some table feeds, it will spit out everything, whatever you want. It doesn't matter. But if you have a view to the data that talks about your customer purchases, that's a different matter. It can talk about that, and you can find out uh, about things uh, about that. Or you can uh, have an actual conversation about ethical requirements uh, or, or limitations of your solution, uh, because you can't do that on a table level. You can do that on a level of uh, real-world semantics. Right? When you talk about people, that's not the entrance in the database. So um, where does that lead us? So we're past Act 3. Um, and I, I do realize, as a developer, you're very often not in the position to just blank slate and re-architect everything, because well, we all live in a world of, well, we can do incremental changes, and we have this little app here that has to work with the rest of the world. Uh, but there, there's uh, things that can make your life easier. Uh, one very simple thing is, is uh, obviously to uh, get the right tools or better tools. Uh, for me, for example, HANA Studio wasn't a great user experience, um, still isn't. Same with Web IDE, especially when you're working with SQL as Text manipulation, they're not, in my perspective, the best text editors. They're better ones, right? And uh, there are a few examples. This one here is uh, dBeaver. It's also an open source tool. Very handy, um, whatever you like, and, and uh, suits your need. But the point is there's op options there that can uh, help you with that. Um, some things that I like uh, would be, OK, you want some form of query formatting. Um, ideally, it would be formatting on meaning. Uh, we'll see later on what I mean by that. But uh, things like syntax highlighting, uh, using ligature fonts that, that give you nice pictures, uh, that can help a lot taking mental burden away if you don't have to read uh, smaller 
uh, than or greater than to mean not equal and that sort of stuff. Um, so that's quite important. Um, and then with that set up, uh, what you can do is uh, sort of where we uh, started off with, you can start and refactor your actual code towards understanding, not towards, uh, I don't know, line count uh, or something like that, but try and make it um, more understandable to yourself and maybe to your team and maybe to the client, right? So this whole idea of refactoring is obviously old. Uh, started with small talk, the ideas of, okay, you can change the structure of your code without actually changing what it does. And by doing that, allowing you to change it easier in the future and to make other changes. So you can do the same, uh, and there's, there's this famous book by Martin Fowler and Kent Beck, um, definitely worth a read. Um, to, to find good examples for that. And that you can do that actually with, with SQL as well. It's, it's not that hard to do. Um, so um, this Marcus Wienand uh, mentioned before from Modern SQL. Here's this uh, little page where he talks about literal SQL, where he refers back to uh, Knuth, when he talks about literal pro programming. And the idea is that you have meaningful names in your code that tell you what, what the code is about in a way that you can actually read it. I don't need to go over this uh, right now. We were going to see that uh, a lot more just now. And also sort of show it in a way that you can consume it reasonably as a um, uh, developer. Uh, one thing here I'd like to point out is uh, you see this width clause here and then the, the, the columns that the width clause produces and then all the rest is just code folded away in the editor, right? So you've written your table expression there. Whatever happens in there, when you read that overall statement, you don't need to worry about that. You can look into it if you want to. You can use a code editor and um, unroll it. But uh, for now, you can just say, OK, I know what's coming back from that uh, uh, part query from this customer credit debit. Uh, and I can focus on the rest of my query. Right? So, and there we see what we do there. So we can actually do that in a single uh, SQL query very easily. All right. Uh, I hope nobody is completely lost. I'm not sure about the time. Okay. Well, then we need to be very quick because this is a, a slightly more advanced example. Um, and th this is just to show you that this is how I did the refactoring in this case, right? So I used dbeaver on the one uh, side. That was the original query. I made up some random test data, so that's uh, obviously meaningless. And on the other side, I just ran my changed query and had a visual comparison of uh, did any of the data change, right? And that, that works out surprisingly well. You don't need to have an automated uh, check all the time. So let's see how we go. Um, uh, not sure that works so well in this uh, uh, this thing, the the color scheme. Um, Anyone rough idea what that is? I'm pretty sure if I tell you, you know that. Yeah, it's of, it's of course customer aging accounts receivable aging report, right? So this is the way it, it should look like. The idea is you got um, money waiting for it to come in. Customers should pay you money. And uh, there's this observation, well, the, the longer you wait, the less likely it is you get it. Uh, so you want to address um, this topic in a, in a reasonable way. Uh, and you want to sort of have an overview of uh, where's my money, right? It's, it's, it's not a particularly um, crazy requirement. It's actually very, very common. <laughs> so uh, let's go back to that query, uh, if we see it. Yeah. So the first bit of the Query and that, that again, example from the, the HANA community, right? I didn't make that up at all and uh, I, was, I just wanted to know what it does. <laughs> I looked into that. So the first thing uh, in here that I saw is, okay, they've got this select now from dummy all over the, the query. Um, well, that, that is obviously uh, the current timestamp. And guess what? There's a function, current timestamp. We can just replace that um, and move on without having any changes. Uh, the next thing then I did, because I, I didn't know what exactly this was all about, is to just reformat the thing, to make it more visible to me what's happening. Uh, 
I tend to reformat it in a way that I see that uh, SQL statement syntax uh, structure popping out a bit. So, um, yep. So I, I see the select, I see the um, from clause, the where clause, the group by, and all of that uh, in one go. Oh, thanks for that. So we just done here, right? So now I see, okay, there's a group by, and it actually it does have a having clause uh, and an order by. Okay. Um, next thing is, uh, as I mentioned before, I don't like this, uh, and that's a matter of taste, right? It works both ways. Uh, I don't like this uh, smaller, this angel bracket thing for, for not equal. I like to write exclamation mark um, equal sign for not equal. And with the editor, I get this nice not equal sign then, which is, I like it. <laughs> uh, and it does help me to just read the code easier. Right? Uh, and that's the point of it. Um, then I, it has this classic join syntax, which is syntactically correct and valid. Uh, I like to be explicit, so I change it to an inner join with the join conditions just to, again, help me to read that thing and to make sure I understand what's happening. Um, the next thing is, um, if you look at that having clause, you see there's uh, one bit that says uh, larger than zero, then the same bit repeated, and it says smaller than zero. Well, we might as well say, well, that is the same when it's not zero, right? Um, so that makes it a bit easier again. Um, and then we see, and we've noticed that before, there's a lot of repetition in that code, which is quite annoying because um, every time I need to change something, I would go and I would have to go and change every, every instance of this. So we, we like to pull this out. Uh, one very common refactoring generally is to do a uh, pull out of a function. I just create a function, and yeah, we can do that here too. We got uh, a SQL, a user defined function uh, that does just that bit, right? So it does this uh, weird uh, change of, okay, if, if they are debits, what was it? If they're debits, then uh, show those debits uh, negative. Uh, if they're credits, just show those. It's not very complicated, but we needed a function here to do that. Um, and the next thing then is to say, well, um, there's this uh, weird calculation when days between. So this is this uh, bracketing that we saw on the output of, of the, the different uh, ages of the customer, and somehow that needs to be expressed. There's this function days between that gives you the number of days between two dates, um, and that's repeated all over. And we, we do see the bracketing here, right? From 0 to 30, from 30 to 60. And here, maybe, at that point, you already realize, okay, that might be not quite right, because this condition includes 30, where the actual bracket says 31. So that's something that wouldn't have popped up for me uh, when I just read the whole uh, code like that. So we can pull this out and create a, um, a common table expression, uh, this, this with clause that we've seen earlier. And in it, with, with that, we, we get the whole statement uh, now split up in this function. We get this tiny with clause where we say, okay, this is our select statement that just gathers the data. This is what it returns, right? And we can close this with, with code folding. And this is the remaining statement, which is already much, much smaller. So we, at, at that level, we can say, okay, we start off from customer debit credits information, and then we do some some aggregation we based on the customer name so there's some sum and then there's some some other stuff happening here and you still need to figure that one out uh, but it's already a lot simpler to 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 work with these different concerns of that statement and yet uh, so, so far nothing much has happened in terms of result set right so that's that's important to realize it's still the same result that we we get of that statement so now, next thing is um, this very defensively programmed, right? So the developer here said, ah, okay, in case the sum of whatever happens in here is, is null, I want to print out a zero. Well, it's not bad thinking, but it's completely superficial. Null is defined as returning, uh, sum is defined as returning a zero when there is no data, right? So 
uh, we can get, a, get rid of all these if null uh, statements here. Um, there I forgot one else clause. Um, so again, this is a bit shorter, moving on. So now we have this construct here where we, uh, we calculated the due days. We moved that into the, um, into the, the with clause. So this function of dates between, we only have that once in our, um, in our code and now we're referring to the due days instead. Uh, but we got this comparison coming over and over here. Um, and it's always, okay, it's larger than and smaller than something else. Mm, we got a comparison operator called between that we can use. But we want to be careful here because between has a semantic that says, okay, I include both endpoints, right? And that needs to match what we have here in terms of logic, right? So in this case, uh, since um, we have this weird construct here with a, a greater than, we need to uh, change the, the endpoint in the code for that. So, and this is the point where you do want to be careful, right? This is the point where you might want to go back to your actual users and say, okay, well, what is actually the meaning of this? Do, do, do you mean this range and should they overlap or shouldn't they overlap? Uh, that's something that's not just a pure technical refactoring uh, because here you, you actually touch uh, meaning and uh, what you get out of it. Right. Next thing is, and I wrote a blog about this because I, I got surprised by this. Um, current timestamp. Um, most people would say, well, I'm not actually interested in at, that the, the data changes based on the time of day I run that report. When I run it on Wednesday, I want to see the same data the whole Wednesday. And the next day, I want to update it for that date. So what I actually wanted is um, a date-based calculation. Uh, days between, however, works on timestamps, right? So if, if you put in a timestamp uh, and a date, a due date, what it will do is we'll say, okay, well, I first need to cast the due date to a timestamp, making it midnight uh, on that day, and take whatever is left uh, that I've been given. So your calculation here is actually based on timestamps, which does change your, your meaning. And it, uh, in some cases, it gives you more or less days in between two, uh, two days. Um, and yeah, but I got surprised by this, so I wrote a block about this. You want to be careful about that. I just figured, okay, in this case, people do want to have current date instead, which we can put in. So that's corrected. Uh, next thing is um, this customer debit function. We do this over and over again in this section of the query. And we could do this here in the with clause. We could just move that over because then we only have to call it twice and that's less code for us to write. So let's do that. So now we got it here and we don't need to actually give back these syscret and balducret columns anymore. So that's easier now. Um, and now I thought, oh, might be a good idea to see, well, does it still run as fast, right? You might just want to test that eventually. And uh, the first test I did, uh, I had just barely any test data, nothing really. And I thought, ah, just let's blow that up and just generate a few million entries. And lo and behold, there was a difference, right? So with the uh, function, with the user-defined function, you do, uh, there, there is a price you pay in terms of performance. Um, it's, it's not like it's, it's uh, totally nothing. Obviously, it does help with your uh, development because you can factor stuff out very easily. But if performance is really a huge concern, in this case, um, yeah, it still came back very, very fast in under a second, even with a few million records. But if performance is a concern, you might want to consider, okay, maybe not, right? So, but since we've refactored all this, now we can take this logic and just replace it twice in here instead of, uh, I don't know, eight times before which I'll just do in the next step. And that also gets rid of the additional development artifact that we just introduced, right? So now we, don't, we, we are back to one self-contained query. We don't have another function that we need to uh, maintain. That's probably a good effect. So then um, in the explain plan again, uh, I could uh, see there were some, some um, 
uh, automatic conversions of data types that, that you might want to check because that's additional work that happens. That's rather technical and okay, well, I'm a database guy, so at some point you need to allow me to do that. So um, I fixed that up. Um, and at that point, I would say we were good to stop with that. Uh, Phil is happy. <laughs> uh, because, well, obviously you can go further um, with, with changing. But the point is, thinking back to the original statement, this one gives you many more options to, to change and to rethink what you want to do and how you want to approach it, right? Uh, besides the fact that this one actually tells you what it does when you look at it, right? So it's about customer credit and debits. Uh, and you do see how the output looks like, and that you also only want to see uh, entries where there's actually something to report. But um, that's something that wasn't so obvious just before. And that's just uh, a, a relatively few steps to take. Um, so the, the, uh, just to compare again the, the, the slides, uh, the, the outputs, we see that uh, the output data for the computed um, time slots has changed because we changed how the slots were made up and we also changed the timestamp computation. Um, and we could go further, right? One thing is um, to realize, okay, actually um, this, sorry, this, this query um, is actually an aggregation on two different aggregation levels. The one thing uh, it aggregates on is just on the customer and it takes a sum of everything that is outstanding. The other is an additional level where we say we bracket the records. That again wasn't so obvious before either. So what you could do then, uh, oh, wrong direction, is to go, well, okay, I'm going to get rid of this pivoting thing because my, um, my, my reporting UI does pivot anyway quite well. I don't need to program that in SQL. What I do is I'm just going to compute the bracketing and for that, again, I can have implement uh, different options. I can make that flexible if I want to. Uh, and just go and say, well, uh, for the sum, I just uh, sum it up again in the front end and have that calculation much easier. So not to say this is the way to go, but just changing the structure of the query and making it in a meaningful way gives you other options that you can think about, um, whereas the other query well, try with an index, maybe. So, um, well, and there, there we are at the finale. You, you've made it <laughs> very good, um, which is sort of uh, summing up my recommendations or what I think is, is good practice. I try and refactor for understanding, right? Don't try to, to sort of say, oh, well, I need to get rid of all functions and I need to use all these uh, data types. Try and make your code understandable to yourself, to your future self, and maybe to your teammates. Uh, try to use the right tools. Nobody, like, being forced to just use the um, text editor and web IDE, probably not really uh, nice. Um, try and make simple queries in the, in the meaning of uh, make the queries about one thing. Don't try and mix everything up. Um, there's this tendency of, of a lot of developers trying to be super flexible and, yeah, we, we just uh, do it in the query and the query figures out what it needs to look up on the fly. Don't do that. Uh, you're making your life much harder. Database isn't good at that. Uh, tell you now. I've seen that a few times. <laughs> um, and try to not get uh, stuck at this getting stuff done level. Uh, I know it's, it's uh, like getting from, okay, I'm getting my job done and then I can move on to the next thing. That's something that's very, very appealing. Uh, but you do let go of a lot of opportunity to, to get more out of your tools and, and uh, what you actually write about. And well, they, just as with, with normal uh, literature, if you want to write well, um, you need to read. Uh, and there's this, uh, I use user forums and open source to just see uh, what, what people do and then how they express things. And some are really nice, others are examples that come up here. Um, but it, it's an opportunity to also challenge yourself and see, okay, well, how would I make that better? And why, why don't I understand that, what's happening there? What, what, what kind of weird witchcraft is that? So um, that's something that works worked quite well for me. So then you can get your diner and get into the sunset. That's me. Well done.